Okay, uh, thanks for being here. Um, little technical hitch. Uh, the idea was that certain things that were on my tablet were going to go be up here. But we can put men on Mars apparently, but we can't get two computers to do it. But anyway, not to worry, we will soldier on. Um, basically, uh, firstly, I'd just like to come to one little share um, about cognitive dissidence, um, which is a, a um, I'll find it in a sec, sorry. Going smoothly so far. Okay, I can't find it, never mind. Um, basically, cognitive dissonance is something, is a psychological term. And a lot of scientists and skeptics suffer from this, uh, well, condition. And basically, cognitive dissonance is a situation where a person has very strong personal beliefs. This occurs a lot with scientists because they go through our education system. Now, our education system doesn't teach you how to think. It teaches you what to think. Um, now, you, uh, the education system designed on being able to regurgitate old knowledge. And OK, a lot of that knowledge might be really good, but nonetheless, that's how you get on um, from an education point of view. You come up with new knowledge that hasn't firstly been established and peer reviewed and all that. You basically get marked very lowly and you're wrong because no one else has said that. And so valuable knowledge gets lost. So scientists in particular have a very strong uh, belief system because of the nature of the scientific method, because of the nature of them going through to high levels of education. So what happens is when a scientist is challenged on their strong beliefs, they get very uncomfortable. Um, I liken it to possibly saying, well, you know, I'm going to tear down your house and build a new one. You know, and you're going to say, well, no, I don't want you to tear down my house. I know where everything is and the house is perfectly fine and, you know, I like my house. So I don't really want you to tear down my house and build a new one. Uh, but that's basically what's going on when you present a belief that doesn't fit with the paradigm of someone who has very strong beliefs, i.e. scientists and skeptics. So this is uh, the reason why there is a lot of uh, resistance uh, from a lot of scientists. There are, of course, uh, many scientists, and this is part of the reason why I'm giving my talk. A lot of scientists in the last six months, Western scientists, uh, are now, it's as though that the... Um, Truth embargo, which has been used quite a lot by a lot of people, has been lifted in the last uh, six months. So I, I have been watching the UFO phenomenon uh, through, for the first 33 years of my life, through mainstream media. Uh, in, anything that came out in the newspaper or the magazines or on the radio or the TV or anything like that, I was onto it. And then at 33 years of age, I joined this group. That was 25 years ago. So for the last 25 years, I've had a bit more hands-on experience, firstly as an investigator and later as a media spokesperson involved with the subject. So I've been following this subject for 50 years. I can still remember sitting in my lounge room at my grandparents' place in, I think it was 1967, um, when the 10 o'clock news, uh, Channel 2 News, came on and uh, gave the story of Snippy, who was the first animal uh, mutilation case. Uh, ever recorded. It was a horse in America. Um, it, was, it was surgically removed, part of its head and neck and, and various other things as, as what happens in uh, animal mutilations. No sign of any blood or anything like that. And uh, even the Channel 2 News was sort of saying, well, you know, that some people are saying that, you know, that this could be some sort of ET related event, you know. And even at like, what is it, about seven or eight years of age or something like that, you know, I sort of went, wow, you know, I was, I'd always been interested in science, but the whole idea of, of ETs was just simply a, um, a progression 
if you're interested in space, then you know, you're going to be interested in what's out there. So it was a natural progression for me, unlike a lot of other scientists. But anyway, uh, so, so that's about 50 years ago that, that happened. So I've been watching this, uh, this subject for that amount of time. So what I'm looking for as I classify myself as, as a UFO theorist, you know, I'm not an investigator anymore or anything like that, but I do have a lot of, you know, I have my own personal theories, uh, which I use a lot with the media, obviously. And the media don't like talking theoretically about UFOs because that puts them in a box, right? Generally speaking, when you're dealing with the media, uh, the way they're going to uh, play it is uh, uh, so they're going to talk in terms of facts, you know. So, uh, D Doug, why is there no evidence? Why is there no craft? Why is there no alien beings? And, and most presenters, well, great percentage of them, have very little or no knowledge of the subject. So they basically, if you have very little or no knowledge of the subject, you have a very limited frame of reference to attack. And they only really have the proof angle to attack. Um, and so that's where they like to keep the conversation. When, when you start getting theoretical, um, basically then if you're having a theoretical discussion about a subject to someone, then they really do need to know what they're talking about to be able to sort of say, well, 75% um, of the universe formed and cooled into planets before our part did. Um, we know there's a planet out there that's 13 billion years old. Ours is about four and a half, so that's about eight and a half billion years difference. So that is a sort of range we're looking at where advanced civilizations could be um, is it not true that we know a lot more now than what we did, as James MacDonald was talking about, a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago? Of course we do. You know, what was impossible then is now possible. We're doing it. So all of this is true. And you've got millions of reports on records. You might say, okay, uh, testimony is not something that, you know, so what, somebody saw something. Now, if all of you people saw me robbing a bank, or even one of you saw me robbing a bank, and you were prepared to go into court and say, yes, that was him, I saw him coming out of the bank with the bag of money and the gun and everything. That will, if there are enough circumstantial evidence to support it, that would be enough to put me in jail for robbing. Uh, yet in a court of science, the jails would be empty. No one would be in there. Um, Kerry Whelan's murder case is a prime example of that. Uh, the guy that got charged, he is in jail now for her murder. The body was never found, and obviously neither the murder weapon. Yet there was enough circumstantial evidence and grainy, blobby CCTV pictures to convict him, which is the other thing they always talk about. How come all these pictures are grainy and blobby and all that sort of thing? Well, if they, they have to be grainy or blobby because if they weren't, you'd say they were CGI. So, yeah, it's a, it's a nice little win-win situation for them. But basically, if you get into that sort of theoretical thing where you're, you're throwing uh, these sort of join-the-dots logic to somebody, then they really do need to know where they're going in order to, uh, to, to, to argue, continue that argument against you. And that's why, basically, they don't like going down that theoretical track. They'd rather keep it evidence-based. Now, in regard to uh, what's happened that I've noticed in the last six months is that there are a lot of Western scientists now coming out and talking about things such as um, the fast radio bursts that people have been picking up. I'm sure probably most of you here. Does anyone know, not know about the fast radio bursts that people have been picking up? Okay. The fast radio bursts are bursts of enormous energy. We're talking hundreds of times the power of the sun in a split second. It's an enormous amount of energy. And it's coming from very, very deep in space. We don't know exactly, well, we know a rough region, but can't identify exactly. 
Anyway, this Fasto Radio Bursts are coming out. We've had now, I think, probably 17, 18 of them going back over probably 15 years. Um, and we have no explanation for them. There are some are occurring in the same place, some are occurring randomly, so there isn't, there isn't a natural phenomena that fits. If it was happening in the same place, then one could presume it may be some kind of neutron star that's releasing energy at certain points. But this is a random event and it's not happening at the same place at the same time on a regular basis. So basically all of the usual culprits um, are dismissed in regard to fast radio bursts. Now, uh, scientists and Western scientists, and unfortunately, as I said, I can't get this up there, but um, Western scientists, and when I'm talking about Western scientists, you know, from America, from England, and this sort of thing, are now saying that these fast radio bursts may be propulsion systems from extremely advanced alien craft. This is something that they're putting on the table as a possibility, as a very real possibility. Um, whereas in the past, that was possibly number, you know, 510, you know, with a real five question marks behind it. Well, now they're coming out and saying, well, you know, th this, is a, this is a very real possibility that this is what uh, is causing these fast radio bursts. Now, prior to this year, you would get information like this coming from scientists from Kazakhstan or, uh, you know, Ubikistan or Russia or China or somewhere like that. And you'd get a news story coming off AAP about, you know, the scientists saying similar things. But now we're getting scientists from uh, Western world. And we all know, um, or any of you that have followed UFOs in the media, know that the Western world deal very differently with the UFO phenomenon than the rest of the world do. Um, if you ever get onto YouTube or something like that and look at UFO stories that have happened, say, in, in China, um, it will just be a newsreader sort of going, you know, blah, 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 UFO, stop traffic, uh, close down the airport for six hours, da, 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 da. You know, no X-Files thing, nothing. And then just blah, 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 and next news item. That's the way they deal with it in, in China and Russia and Romania and places like that. Um, we know how Western media deal with it. You know? <laughs> uh, Australian, uh, American, English and so on deal with it in a, in a very different way to the, what everyone else does. But now we're starting to find these people from Western scientists that are coming out and saying this sort of stuff. Uh, the, other, the other thing that they're talking about is that uh, there's this planet out there that is planets when they have uh, various other planets getting in between our viewing space and the planet can dip in light by ending up to one or two percent as something passes in front of it from our view. That's normal for it to dip one or two percent. There's a planet out there, or uh, a sun rather, a sun, that is dipping by 22%. Uh, and sometimes less, sometimes more. But it's dipping around about 22%, which is like even if Jupiter was going around this sun, it would dip only by 1 or 2%. So what the hell is blocking the light of this thing by 22%? We're talking about something 20 times the size of of Jupiter, or ten, at least 10 times the size of Jupiter. Now, what has, again, been suggested by Western media is that this may be what's uh, referred to as a Dyson shield. A Dyson shield is a theoretical uh, thing that was thought of by a scientist, I think the 1950s, when he was talking, you know, we all know about class zero, class one, class two, class three, civilizations, we're a class zero, 
because we still use fossil fuel. Class one uses the energy of their sun. Class two uses the energy of their solar system. Class three uses the energy of the galaxy. Class four may use the energy of the universe and so on. And this is the theoretical level of advancement as to what, what level of, you know, almost like school, kindergarten, first class, second class, and so on. We're kindies. So a class one civilization uh, would basically have, would be able to control the energy of their parent sun. And basically a Dyson shield is like an enormous solar panel. So you imagine that that's uh, an enormous solar panel, again we're talking 10 times the size of Jupiter, that is revolving in a fairly close orbit around its parent sun and that energy is being beamed back to the planet to control all the energy requirements of the planet. So this, of course, is, is you know, high technology. And it has been suggested, again, not as a, a, uh, an unlikely scenario, but a likely scenario because of the lack of anything else. Uh, the only other possibilities that are lurking at the moment are um, uh, uh, swarms of asteroids that may be going in front of the sun from our vision uh, or something like that, but basically, or swarms of comets even. Um, but again, this is not really fitting what we're seeing. It's not really fitting the scenario of what this is. Um, and we can't see any of those comets or what have you. We don't know of their existence, so that, that's, a, that's as much as a guess as anything else is. But just to have uh, these kinds of, just to have these kinds of uh, uh, ideas coming up from Western media uh, is, is very different to what it's been in the past. As I said, you know, you, you, you get these things coming from elsewhere, but not from Western media. And we're getting that in the last six months. So obviously, from my point of view, as a theorist, as an analyst, um, I go, something is, something is different here. Something is going wrong. In addition to this, um, there is also a spike, worldwide global spike, in UFO sightings. Uh, in some cases, in some states of America, UFO sightings are up by one, over 100%, according to MUFON. There has been a steady increase uh, over the last couple of years, and at the moment we're experiencing a peak year of UFO activity. So that's an interesting thing that goes with all these Western scientists that have seemingly been allowed to discuss these sorts of ET possibilities without the fear of uh, derision, uh, without the fear of expulsion from their communities. Um, I think it was about six years ago, there was a online skeptics magazine uh, in America. And one of the guys there was a book reviewer and his job was to review books, obviously, um, for the E-Line magazine. And he reviewed a book by Leslie Keane, who, if you don't know who she is, is a, a, a journalist from the Boston Times. I can't quite remember what it is. Anyway, a Boston newspaper, very big Boston newspaper. Uh, very well-respected journalist. Has written a lot of UFO books. And... Uh, as a very good journalist, she's very good at presenting a story uh, and double checking her facts and making sure that all the T's are crossed and all the I's are dotted. And anyway, this book reviewer fellow said that exactly that. He said, well, you know, I mean, he, he didn't come out and say, well, this proves that UFOs are real or anything like that. He just simply said this was a very well-written book and uh, it was very uh, accurate in as far as, uh, and precise in regard to how it checked its facts and all that sort of thing. A very factual, uh, 
well done book from that perspective without, as I said, giving any indication to whether or not, uh, you know, he believed it or anything like that. Anyway, when this came out on the Inline, Ma Inline magazine, there was such a furor by the members of uh, Skeptics America, they wanted the guy that did the book thing sacked, they wanted the president sacked. Um, there was a huge thing, uproar, about how dare this person come out and say that this book was well researched. It's a UFO book. So that's, that's only about six years ago. So you see what I mean? You're getting, you're getting these things coming out. And not only are they coming out in the media, they're coming out in scientific journals that are peer-reviewed. So it's a very big difference from what has been. And then I said, we've got, as well as that, a huge spike in UFO sightings. Now, before this year, my thinking was pretty much this, that when it comes to the UFO phenomenon, like I said, you know, I've been following it 50 years, and I would like first contact to happen tomorrow just as much as any of you would. I really would. Um, I think it would be great. God knows we need help. And just the whole... Well, not only, you know, not only the, the help factor that we will, we assume they come in peace, you know, um, but just the uh, enormity of it. I mean, there is no doubting that such a thing would be the biggest story in the history of mankind, bar none. We're not alone. There's someone over the other hill, and they're here. Um, what sort of things can they teach us? What sort of things can we learn from this? Cancer cures and well, who knows. So, you know, I mean, it would be a wonderful thing on a number of levels. Uh, and I think, too, you know, talking on a personal level, I've argued with the media, I've argued with friends, I uh, couldn't understand why people can't see that this is possible. Like, you know, as James McDonald was saying, well, uh, uh, you know, sure, you know, we don't understand how they would be able to travel, you know, 100 light years. But how do you think Neanderthals understood computers and mobile phones and everything else? They had no idea, they had no idea of understanding any of that. And neither have we got any under, and understanding of a civilization that may be 10, 100,000 more years and what they can do and what they can't do. So I think that to some extent, I know I, and I'm sure a lot of you too, would feel very justified. You know, even though we really believe it in our heart and in our logical mind and everything like that, if they actually did land, it's like, told ya. <laughs> There's a bit of that in all of us, I'm sure. You know, it'd just be a lovely feeling. And, and as I said, no more of this taking the crap out of it on TV, no more of this laughing at it, no more of scientists sneering down the nose at us. It's like, there it is, pal. It's real. But as much as all that is true, I've always thought to myself, it's a rather myopic view of, and I think humans naturally are going to have this sort of myopic view of, of life. Now, I've got a universe that's been going for 13, around about 13 and a half billion years. Oop. All right, 13 and a half billion years. That's a very long time, 13 and a half billion years. And in that 13 and a half billion years, lots of stuff has happened. Lots of stuff. Formation of this planet, formation of the solar system, supernovas, bursting, exploding, creating astral nurseries for new suns and new civilizations to spring up. Some civilizations that may have come and rose like the Roman Empire only to destroy themselves and disappear. 
never to be seen again. Maybe that's what we look at when we see some of these pyramids or ruins on Mars. Who knows? So the point is that a hell of a lot has happened in 13 and a half billion years. So as much as we might want it to happen in our lifetime, our lifetime is what? 80 to 100 years. 80 to 100 years. As opposed to 13 and a half billion years. Like as a percentage, I don't, it's point something like 100 zeros and one or something like that. It's an incredibly small slice of time. And yet, we do see an amazing amount of things happen in our life from our point of view. You know, the rise of mobile phones, never used to be there before, you know, all sorts of stuff. Um, but if we look at the, the bigger universal galactic picture, um, there ain't a lot happened in the last 80 to 100 years. And I think if we're talking about a, a universal galactic type event, such as first contact, um, to think it's going to happen in our lifetime uh, is optimistic. Just sheerly considering the amount of time that's, that's available to us. So, and remembering too, when I say that the universe has been going about 13 and a half billion years, that's not even its full life. That's probably about halfway through, maybe not quite halfway through. So the universe's full life is probably up around about 30 billion years. And again, our life is somewhere between 80 to 100. So, generally speaking, as much as I would love to see first contact, I'm thinking uh, it's a bit like winning a lottery three times in a week. But then we have these Western scientists that suddenly the truth embargo, they're allowed to put stories like this where they think that this is a Dyson shield, where they think that fast radio bursts are created by um, alien beings. We've got in that interview, in that um, ancient aliens thing, we saw the woman there from NASA who said that they expect to find um, a likelihood of alien life within a decade and confirmation within 20, 25 years. So things are moving quickly all of a sudden. Um, then we've got this spike in UFO sightings. So the next thing that I'm looking for as an analyst is an increase in close encounter sightings. Uh, if we get an increase in close encounter sightings, and close encounter sightings being ones where you can see it from maybe 100 metres or something like that. It's not just a light in the sky, it's actually a, a craft. You can see its shape, you can see maybe windows, all that sort of thing. If we start getting an increase in close encounter sightings, then I think, logically, that indicates... Uh, a precursor to what may be an ET-led disclosure um, and may well be in our lifetime. Now, a lot of you, I'm sure, are a full bottle with the Illuminati or Elite or whatever you want to call them that control the show and they do not want they don't want this information out. They don't want us to know about the fact that we're not alone. Um, that we have, perhaps, friends that are smarter than us. That can free us from this system which is designed to support a very, very small percentage of the population who's designed to, to make them more rich and powerful and us less so and give them more power and give us less freedom and less liberty and less choice. So they don't want any of that to happen. And that's why for the last 70 years they have been controlling the spread of information through the media 
and debunking the situation because they don't want it to happen because they don't they don't want to lose control of the troops but what if they don't have a choice what if there is contact between ETs and certain elements of American government or whoever it happens to be and the ETs are saying we've been telling you guys 70 years to get ready because we're going to come down and see you. You've done nothing. We're not going to wait any longer. We're coming. We're fed up with waiting. We're coming. So get ready. Now in that situation the Illuminati would have uh, uh, Sophie's choice, if you like. Um, it's on the one hand, they don't really want to give away their hand that they've been lying to us for all this time for their own interest and so on and so on. But one thing that they don't want, even more than that, is panic. Panic on the streets. People losing it. People going, oh, aliens are coming. You know, I mean, Hollywood have done such a wonderful job over the last, well, I don't know, 20, 30 years, more. Right back in the 50s, they had flying saucers coming up to kick our ass, hasn't it? So, I mean, they've been doing it for a long time. There's, there's been this, this thing that, you know, well, it is, you know, I mean, occasionally they're soft and fuddly, cuddly and all that sort of thing, but most of the time they want to eat us or something. So, you know, we, again, we don't want this sort of, they don't want this fear, this sort of losing control of the populace, uh, you know, looting, people just going crazy. So, therefore, there has to be something put in place to drip feed disclosure um, so as it's not such a big shock. Now, all of this stuff in relating to Western scientists that have been released lately are relating to what I call footsteps of ET that they're observing out there, or possible footsteps of ETs. We're seeing maybe the footsteps of class one civilizations with the Dyson Shield and, and maybe class two civilizations with these fast radio bursts and so on. So what we're seeing is these sorts of uh, footsteps of aliens. But don't worry, folks, they're out there somewhere. They could be 500 million light years away. They ain't coming to eat a shit. But nah, they're out there. It's looking like it. And then you get all this other stuff about scientists, you know, regularly coming up and saying, you know, that I mean, even Chef Shostak, that's really hard to say when you're straight. Um, he has said that uh, he expects that SETI will find some sort of signal within about 25 years or thereabouts. And, and you know, he's pretty conservative. So there, there's this, uh, and of course the other thing is that, you know, what we're finding out is these, uh, exoplanets that are out there that, you know, like you go back, what, you know, 20 years, there was none. Didn't even know if there was any planets. Our solar system could be some freako solar system that did this thing and that had planets and didn't happen anywhere else. There were people who believed that, scientists. Um, and now we know that the place is littered with planets. There are just, you know, most suns, and there are billions of suns in our galaxy alone, and there are billions of galaxies. Most of them have at least some exoplanets going around them. And at least some of those exoplanets are in what's called the Goldilocks zone, which is not too hot, not too cold. So life similar to us could exist on those planets. That doesn't mean that on a planet that's very hot, life could not still exist, but may be very different to us. Maybe silicon-based rather than carbon-based or something like that. Anyway, so with this discovery of the enormous amount of, 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 of projected exoplanets that are going to be in our galaxy and hence in other galaxies and things like that, it just becomes mathematically impossible to ignore the fact that we are alone in the universe. You just won't find a scientist with the courage these days to come out and say, oh, no, I think, I think we're it. 
you know, it just doesn't happen. Um, again, it's a case of, sure, they're out there. Uh, yeah, and by their own admission, like as I said, it's not, I didn't make it up, 75% of the universe cooled and formed uh, into solid matter before our part did. We know that by red shift and blue shift and all that sort of astronomical stuff, that they actually did. And as I said, there's a planet, I said, they're 13 billion years old now, it's like four and a half. So we know that the majority of the universe actually did start forming before us. So if it had a head start, it's going to be more advanced than us. Therefore, it's going to know how, they are going to know how to do stuff that we don't know how to do. So that just follows. Um, but the problem, again, is, and I'll refer to um, the same ideological and philosophical uh, way that they thought about meteorites in the early 1800s. I've told this story before, but I'll tell it again because it's a good one, and it relates to faster than light travel. In about 1807, a huge meteorite hit just outside the town of Western Connecticut in America. 197 kilos of rock, um, big burning, bang. Whole town saw this thing crash. It's only just out of town. Anyway, so they all trucked up there and had a look at it, and there's a smoking ruins, and there's all this rock, and it did you know, well. Um, so anyway, a guy called Daniel Salmon contacted the Smithsonian Institute, which was the head scientific institute in America at the time, and said, look, this big rock fell from the sky. Do you guys want to come and have a look at it? And they said, no. And he said, why? And the scientist said, because it didn't fall from the sky. But he said, but it did fall from the sky. The whole town saw it. I saw it. The whole town saw it. It fell from the sky. It crashed in the ground. And it's next to the town right now. No, it didn't do that. You know, um, Western Connecticut has no active volcanoes anywhere near it. Yeah, I know that. So, there's this thing called gravity, right? And gravity says, how is 197 kilo of rock going to go up in the air hang around there for a while, and then suddenly go crash back to next to your town. That doesn't happen. The laws of physics say impossible. So I don't care how many people saw it. I don't care whether you got 197 kilos of rock there. It didn't happen. Bye. Um, Daniel Salmon wrote a letter to um, yeah, the American president at the time, Thomas, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, wrote a letter to Thomas Jefferson and uh, told him about the situation. And Thomas Jefferson then proceeded to write an open letter to the scientific community of America and basically said, guys, you need to open your minds about stuff. And just because something doesn't fit your paradigm doesn't mean it, it, isn't, it hasn't happened. You need to have a, a wider view of things. Uh, eventually, a couple of rogue scientists went and interviewed or went and uh, analysed the meteor, meteorite, which became the first meteorite to ever be analysed in America. That was 1807. So that was, what, uh, 200 years ago? That uh, the Smithsonian Institute did not believe that meteorites existed uh, because they did not have on their radar the idea that meteorites might come from outer space rather than from here. It just wasn't on their radar. Now, you compare that argument, which is the same logical argument that can be used to say, faster than light travel is impossible. Why is faster than light impossible? Because we can't figure out how you do it. That's why it's impossible. The argument was flawed in 1807, and the argument is just as flawed in 2017. It was wrong then, wrong now. So, basically, I think what we're looking at here is, as I said, a, a possibly an ET-led disclosure, although I'm not, you know, as I said, I'm not signing off on it just yet um, because I'm still, I still think that from my mind, 
uh, and I'm a person who thinks about this a lot. This is my favourite thinking subject. Um, we're going to have to see an increase in close encounters first because it's just like... Well, you think about it. You put yourself in their position. If we, for some reason, found some lost tribe in New Guinea or something like that, you know, we, we, you know, maybe hundreds of years ago we would have done things differently. But today, everyone would have said, oh, lost tribe. Well, you know, we've got to be careful about this. We can't just go barging in there with television. Hello, I'm from Channel 9. It is to meet you. You know, how many people have eaten today? Oh, good. Um, you know, it's... We, we have to do it a bit more culturally correct these days. So, you know, I'd imagine there'd be a bit of a sort of maybe initially uh, gorillas in the mist sort of um, observation where we might drop some troops in and, you know, hide behind the bushes and take some photos and cameras and that sort of stuff. And then maybe, you know, everything will maybe slightly escalate from there. And then we'll maybe start flying over the base. And they'll look up, whoa, 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 what's that? Look at that bird. You ever seen that before? Oh. So, you know, so there'd be a lot of ways that we'd slowly, slowly catch a monkey and get these people used to the fact that eventually we're going to say, g'day, how are you going? So, and I think it's going to be much the same thing. It's not like, what's the point in sort of landing there and scaring the crap out of us, you know? It, it's going to be a case of... And really, I mean, uh, Travis Walton uh, believes uh, this as well. Uh, at, at a luncheon or dinner we had with Travis Walton a few years ago at Katoomba, um, someone asked him about why UFOs put their lights on. You know, like, if they wanted to be stealth about this, it's like, Commander Zark, we're approaching Earth, turn the lights off, that's it. But it doesn't happen that way. Commander Zark, we're, we're approaching Earth, turn the Christmas lights on, that's it, bang, that's brilliant, oh, that's great, terrific. Blue, green, red, fantastic. They'll see us for miles. So, if it's a stealth subject, which it obviously... I mean, this is a subject that doesn't follow any set rules. You've got major sightings over Mexico. There's recently been major sightings over Texas and Turkey, which is another component to this ET-led disclosure, is, is mass sightings. Well, we've had a couple this year, one over Turkey, one over Texas. The Mexico thing was quite a few years ago now, in the 80s. But we've had two mass sightings over Turkey uh, and also Texas. So, but predominantly it seems to be this very much, as I said, softly, softly approach where it will, it doesn't mind if three or four people see them. That's okay. That's good. We want three or four people to see it and three or four people to go and talk about it. And uh, so it seems to be something that is not is not totally covert. If it was totally covert, we wouldn't have a UFO group because no one would see them. We all have had reports of UFOs that just disappear. Now, okay, maybe they're interdimensional craft and they're flipping back home. Um, or maybe they've got a propulsion system that's so fast that they've actually taken off and it looks like it's disappeared. But in other cases, people are absolutely certain that the UFO disappeared. Hence, we have this term, Star Trek term, cloaking. That you, some UFOs appear to be cloaked, and they will suddenly appear, and then suddenly disappear. So again, this is if they have that level of uh, technology to be cloaked. Some of the time, they can be cloaked all the time. We wouldn't see them at all. And then at nights, they just simply turn the lights off, and we wouldn't see them at all. You know, black object in a black sky. You don't see much of that. So. With this deliberate effect to sort of let some of us know about this over a period of time. And you've got to remember, again, you know, you've got to look at time and what happens over that period. Now, the UFO phenomenon has been going, the modern UFO phenomenon, anyway, 
has been going for around about 70 years. Now, I believe there's something like a couple of hundred thousand or at least a hundred thousand reports on record that the United Nations has. Plus reports that, you know, Blue Book got. Plus reports private organisations like us that would have got. Plus reports from other UFO organisations uh, all over the world, media outlets and so on and so on. And let's remember that research has shown roughly only one in ten sighting is ever reported. So there may well be worldwide hundreds of thousands of reports per year. And that represents one-tenth of the actual sightings. So that, yeah, you know, it took a million sightings. And that's been going on for 70 years. Well, isn't that 70 million people? That's a lot of people. So if you're trying to very slowly drip feed people, like, you know, as I said, when I used to do investigations and things like that, you know, and sometimes when I'd, I'd talk about it, you know, I remember discussing with my uncle uh, about the UFO thing. And he was saying back in the 30s, his brother was at Clyde Railway Station. Uh, he was doing afternoon shifts and he was there like 3 o'clock in the morning. And there was this brilliant object as big as the sun that sort of came across the railway station. And that, and that was in about 1930, right? So there's a lot of stories of people, anecdotal stories, that go back, you know, not just to 1940s. It goes back beyond that. So there's, there's been a lot of sightings over a lot of period of time. Okay, maybe not all of those people have reported it, but it sunk into the human psyche quite a bit over that period of time. So we have been, to some extent, um, prepared for a long period of time for this. And I think they've shown, or the ETs have shown, enormous uh, patience uh, to wait as long as they have. But I think... The more evolved um, a species is, the more the species appreciates time. And like I was saying before, you know, when you look at the comparison between our lifetime and the universe's lifetime, it's just, it's just so, to say it's um, insignificant is <laughs> the understatement of the, you know, understatement of the world. So, and I think that, you know, as I said, significant advanced races understand this and they understand the concept of, uh, you know, of being patient, of taking time to, uh, to understand uh, what requirements are. And I mean, they don't really know how quickly we are going to take this up. How, how well we're going to accept it. Uh, so that's another factor, you know. I mean, they have to sort of go slowly because... And, and again, we, you know, we, we as humans are a very diverse population. And there are some people that uh, are not going to take this well. You know, if there was disclosure or first contact tomorrow, there's a lot of people that are not going not gonna to take it well. Perhaps a lot of religious people might find it hard to fit in their paradigm. Uh, a lot of people who are very sceptical about the subject for, for over a long period of time are going to find it very hard to digest. So it's not going to be, it's not going to be easy for everyone uh, when it happens. It'll be easy for us, but it's going to be difficult for a lot of people. So they have to factor those sorts of things in as well. So I think that, uh, yeah, I think that all sort of leads to the possibility, uh, at least the uh, potential possibility, of, of first contact or ET-led first contact uh, happening uh, within our lifetime in, in the near future. <clears throat> uh, assuming that we get more of these uh, mass sightings and we start getting an increase in close encounter sightings. And I think then we're, we'll be pretty much ready to move. 
Um, another interesting thing is that the uh, geomagnetic field of the planet has doubled in the last couple of days. Uh, it's gone from about 500 megahertz or whatever it is to over 1,000. And that's been confirmed by places in New Zealand and Peru and America and Europe and what have you. They, have a, they measure the geomagnetic force of the planet, which, as I said, has, has doubled over the last uh, couple of years. A, a couple of days, sorry. <clears throat> so, I, you know, now that doesn't... It seems strange to me because they say, oh, this can happen due to solar flares or other, um, other changes within other bodies within the solar system. Now, generally, if there is high solar flare activity, we know about that. So why, why don't these people know? You know, they say, oh, well, yeah, that's why we've got to jump here because there's a really a big solar flare activity. Well, as far as I know, there's no increase in solar flare activity at the moment. Um, but yet, the geomagnetic field has doubled in the last 24 uh, last well, last couple of days. So some interesting things occurring. Uh, if you sort of link them all together, uh, it does indicate that Things are different. Things may be changing. Um, as I said, there's a bit more to, to uncover, a bit more to, uh, uh, to come through. But I think it is, it is starting to look as though things may be changing uh, in the near, well, you know, I don't know. I mean, again, you know, we're talking about a very patient race. And, and this process might take another five years, I don't know. But at least we could be looking at the start of some sort of an ET-led um, disclosure, which again forces the Illuminati into preparing us uh, in initially uh, a very gentle way, which appears to be happening at the moment with this... Uh, release of information in regard to, like I say, ET, or the signs of ET, advanced ET footsteps elsewhere in the universe, plus the absolute immensity, oh, mind-blowing immensity of uh, exoplanets that are likely to be out there, several of which are likely to be, uh, well, similar to our sort of planet, liquid water, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, uh, sorry if I've been a little bit disjointed, but as I said, I've just been thrown out because I had a whole bunch of stuff here which I was going to go through uh, one thing at a time, and uh, I didn't have it. So, uh, something may come to me later, but anyway, how are we doing for time? What's the time now? You have got 25 minutes. Okay, well, let's just, uh, does anyone have any questions about anything that I've said so far? Yeah. Yeah. I thought he died some months ago, uh, Bruce Farrell. In, in prison? Yeah, I think he did. He, he may have. I, I, I don't know. But, yeah. But it was just, it just, uh, it, but it's just the, the difference between a court of law and a court of science. And that was the, the point, you know, that, um, that, you know, we've even had, you know, I mean, the sort of credibility of these witnesses, like, you know, astronauts, Edgar Mitchell, um, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, um, you know, uh, police on duty, um, and so on and so on and so on, you know, so many credible witnesses. And even, again, you know, going back to Travis, you know, having talked to the guy and met the guy, he's just the most genuine, honest person you could ever meet, you know, and there's no way, no way in the world he is crazy or making it up. No way. And, and, you know, so the credibility factor of these people that are seeing things uh, uh, just off the scale. And, and in a court of law, it would be a done deal. Absolute done deal. You know, to go to law and, you know, put E.T. in the dock, so to speak. 
guilty. Yeah, he'd come up guilty. Yeah, you're in all right. You, you're going to get 15 years. Um, because there's absolutely no, in a court of law, there would be no contest. It, it, it would just be proven fact. There is, um, I mean, if you look at circumstantial evidence, I mean, you look at radar printouts and things like that, you know, I mean, they're not even testimony. They're things that will, I mean, if you look at the um, Japan Airlines flight over Alaska, when, when Callahan from the uh, American Air Organization, whatever, tra uh, tra safety organization, went and investigated and got the copies of the, of the, um, of the radar that showed this giant walnut-like object that was near the plane and did everything that the pilot said and confirmed everything that the pilot said it had done, which is like five times bigger than the plane. So there's that. Uh, there are ground cases which definitely show, you know, uh, like even just as something as simple as the amount of depression of the circle. There's been many, many cases, particularly France and all over the world, where there has been a depression in the, a paddock or the farmer's paddock or something like that. And they can tell, obviously, by, you know, by how much strength in the ground and what have you, that this was an object weighing approximately 15 tonne. And there's no, there's no drag marks. Like if a truck was carrying an object 15 tonne, they would leave tracks along a paddock to where they dropped it off. So are we saying that this guy hoaxing it, he's got a helicopter that can carry a 15 tonne object. I'm not sure whether helicopters can carry 15 tonne objects, they may be. But anyway, we're talking in one of them big American choppers carrying 15 tonne object that's going to go and land in some Farmer Joe's paddock, drop it there, pull up and go away and cackle to themselves when he finds out in the morning. I mean, you know, really? So there is so much really good circumstantial evidence, not to mention the amazing amount of really credible people. You know, and I was just talking about this the other day uh, with a friend about when I was doing the investigations and things like that, you know, and people would ring up and they'd say, oh, you know, I saw this Starlock object, blah, blah, blah did this and gone, you know, and all that sort of thing. And I'd talk to them for maybe 45 minutes and uh, there's no explanation for what they saw. You know, I mean, how could it zigzag and then rack off into space in a million miles an hour? I mean, that's not a plane, it's not a, it's not a weather balloon, it's not Venus and so on and so on. There is just no explanation for it. And in fact, you know, I mean, I think really UFO should stand for not unidentified flying object, but unknown flying object, because that's what we're really after. Once you've established something as an unknown flying object, then we're dealing with the real deal. Unidentified just plays straight into the hands of the skeptics. Oh, it's a bird, and it's just been identified. But that's all it is, just a bird, but it's been unidentified. That's okay. No, 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 it's not a bird, it's an unknown flying object. Unknown. Birds don't do that unless they've got rockets up their backside. So it doesn't happen. So, uh, you know, I mean, and the point is that these people would spend 45 minutes with me talking on the phone, going through the whole thing. Often it's mum, dad, and the two kids that have seen the object on the back veranda. So it's like this uh, conference thing about, oh, where did it go? Did it go left, dad? Or... No, I went to the right. Oh, I went to the right. That's right. Yeah, and uh, with the, 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 green or blue? No, it went blue, then green, didn't it? Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. And then, yeah, it went blue, green, and etc. So it's quite... Like, I mean, I'm no trained psychologist, but on the, just listening on the phone to these people for 45 minutes, they are real. They're not making this up. They don't ring back five minutes later and laugh and go, ha-ha, sucked you in. No, nothing like that. They're not selling the paper to the, selling their story to the newspaper. They're not doing anything. They don't sound crazy. They're not, not making it up. So the point is, if anybody is going to, you know, argue against such things, I mean, the one question I say is, well, why would they do that? Give me one reason why they wasted, the whole family wasted 45 minutes of their night to talk to me about something. 
Give me one reason why they did that. And no one can. No one can give me a good solid reason why anyone would waste 45 of their minutes for that. Yeah. Doug, uh, unfortunately the computer didn't work. Is it possible for you to get your presentation on the website so we can have a look at it, please? Uh, I'd have to check with my techie guy uh, whether that's possible or not. See, what I did, oh, sorry, what I did was um, I have a Facebook site and I've had it for several years. And initially, um, I couldn't understand why everybody was talking about Facebook because all I was getting was, you know, I painted my nails tonight, you know, or whatever, you know, and I'm thinking, who wants to know this, you know, or well, cat photos. I like cats, but still. Um, and I'm thinking, what is this thing with Facebook? Anyway, so I persisted with it. I, did, I used to go and look at it like, you know, once a month or something, you know. Um, but because if I did find something, uh, you know, if I did find something on news.com, I'd, I'd share it if it was UFO based, you know, to there. Or if I was doing something with the media, I'd put it on there, you know, Doug Moffat interviewed by Channel 7, whatever it is. And, uh, and you know, and, and if somebody else posted something UFO, I'd share that, you know, or might make a comment, not very often, but just share it basically, you know. So, and over a period of like, I don't know, 10 years or something like that, I've now developed this wonderful network of people from all over the world, from America and England and Russia and you name it. And they post really interesting stuff. And, you know, I'm quite addicted to Facebook now, you know, not because I care about who painted the nails or not, but it's just simply, oh, wow, that's an interesting story. What's that? Oh, wow, I didn't know that. that, that oh, that's fascinating. Oh, okay. I mean, okay, there's a lot of crap on there as well. But, you know, like, hey, you just do that and it's gone. And you go into the next story. I don't have Facebook, Doug, so I'd love you to put it on the website. Yeah, well, as I said, I, 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 can, I can see what I can uh, do. But that's, that's basically where... So that's basically where I got the information from, was that all these people from the website. And then it, on the uh, Facebook thing, it's got what's called activity log, which shows you all the stuff that you've shared. And the plan was that I was going to go to the activity log and then just click on all the stuff and then it would come up here, but it didn't, didn't work. But um, so, I, yeah, I don't know. I'm not a techie sort of person, so I, I don't know how, how possible that is, but I'll see what I can do. Yeah, yeah. I'll see what I fucking what I can do in that regard. I might be able to somehow get them posted to Exopolitics, Sydney Exopolitics, or do it that way. But I'll see what I can do. Yeah. So, what's your take on the, the, your, your outline has been very much that the off planet forces are benevolent, that they're waiting for us to be in a state where we're ready. What if that's not the case? So, well, you know, what's your, your yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, I think that in regard to the malevolent ET question, um, again, I, I like to pride myself on on thinking about things long and hard, deep as I can, and then trying to come to a place where it makes sense to me. Uh, we all have personal perspectives, so we can't expect all our personal perspectives to be the same because we're not all the same. So they're all gonna be different. But if as long as it makes sense to me, well, that's as far as I can go with it, you know. Anyway, the point is this. If they wanted to knock us over, it would have been a hell of a lot easier 50 years ago, or 100 years ago, or 200 years ago. So uh, it appears as though the UFO phenomenon has been going on for at least 70 years, and I would say, you know, more than that. And I think the other thing you've got to factor in is that um, 1947, also, as well as the atomic bomb, which I think was the main heads up, something's going, ooh, look at those kids, yep. got the matches. Um, <laughs> I think the other thing is that there has been, since 1947, around about the 1940s, a huge increase, and we talk about the now as being the age of uh, communication, but the birth of that age of communication was certainly in the 40s. 
That's where it really started. It hasn't just started recently. If you go back to the 1940s, what, you know, you sort of TV? Radio. Radio. Radar. Radio, radar. radar, you know, I mean, you know, but, but you know, and, and uh, um, information sharing, okay, information sharing, being able to get, inf you know, once you get back not before 1947, I mean, even the speed of ships that went from England to America and from America to Australia, the whole information sharing really accelerated because of the Second World War. You know, I mean, as many as much as war is an absolutely dreadful, horrible thing, and no one wants it to happen. But one of the, one of the byproducts of war is there's an incredible spike in technology. It's just one of the, you know, there's byproducts of war. And one of the byproducts in that technology spike is communication. And speed, you know. So we, I mean, you had the Germans with the Messerschmitts, the first jets, you know, and then and then you know what was it during the fifties? Then you started getting um, people going from London to New York on planes on a fairly regular base, you know, all this sort of thing. So I think that the UFO uh, phenomenon was probably seen by just as many people prior to 1947. But the information was not circulated as well as it is now. Um, but yeah, so that's my main reason for thinking that, that they're more likely to be uh, benevolent. <laughs> benevolent? Benel that word. Friendly. <laughs> uh, yeah, because. Uh, yeah, we just would have been an easier target to knock off earlier, and I think they've been here for, you know, uh, oh, well, certainly through the, the there's reports of, of sightings going right back to the 1800s, and you know, and all that sort of thing, um, and that's not even including, you know, all the ancient alien stuff, you know, pyramids and God knows what else, Dan Van Daniken and Nazca Plains and everything, so, so I think they've been here for a very long time, and I think if they wanted to. Uh, uh, they wanted to knock us over. I think they could have done that earlier. I still think when you're dealing with uh, an unknown scenario, uh, we're still, you're still looking at unknown results, you know. Um, in, I think it was about 1970, some of you may remember a guy called Patrick McGowan who was a British actor. And he was interviewed on Canadian TV. Very, very intelligent man. And he was asked, I mean, this is the Vietnam War right, time and everything like that. And he said, so what do you see as, the interviewer asked him, what do you see, Patrick, as the major uh, threat to humanity? He said, technology. He said, the major threat to, to, to humanity is technology. And he said, the reason why that's the case is because we don't, nobody checks anything. Nobody sort of goes, oh, hang on, this thing here, now how is this going to work? Now how is this going to affect our society? Uh, are we going to have a, a bunch of people walking around looking at their phone instead of interacting with each other? Oh, I suppose it could happen. Well, maybe we should try it out on some uni students and, and see if they suddenly lose communication with each other and they walk around like this all the time, you know. Um, or, you know, see if somebody, like the red eyes, green eyes, you know, blue eyes, green, uh, brown eyes experiment where, you know, you find bullying happens, you know, with, with internets and that sort of thing. It makes bullies, gives them a whole bigger range of people to pick on. So there's a lot of negatives um, in regard to technology that are just simply not tested because it's, it's just supply and demand and it's just greed and it's just like, you know, people go, hey, the new iPhone brushes your teeth. You know, wow, does it? Oh, I've got to eat myself one of them. Brushes your teeth. Fantastic. So, you know, it's like, and people line up for three days to get the new iPhone that brushes your teeth. So, you know, and it's not like nobody, nobody does any social test to see what sort of implications that's going to have. And, and I think that's what he was, that's what he was meaning by technology uh, being the biggest threat that, uh, 
Um, I mean, you know, I, I've seen a lot of stuff lately. Um, it comes up, I'd say, about every three weeks. Something about having sex with robots. Comes up on news.com about every three weeks, you know. Some guy in Japan's invented this doll and da 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 and it can do this and it can say hello and, you know, can do everything else. And, <laughs> you know, I mean, this sort of stuff's coming up regularly, you know. And this is very much at the early basic stages, but, you know, the, you, again, you've got scientists, like dudes that are, you know, in universities, etc., saying, in like 20 years' time, people are going to be marrying robots. That's what's going to happen. You know, um, that that is really what's going to occur, right? Now, if we, now that's not as, you know, I mean, I know now we look at it socially and we go, oh, marrying a robot, oh, that would be really, you know, bad, you know, like you'd be going out, you know, um, you know, you go out for dinner or something like that and say, hi, how's your Model 27 going? <laughs> You're not a Model 27, just a real person. Yeah, yeah, sure. I've seen the catalogue. I've got a Model 28. Stuck, uh, 20 years ago, same-sex marriage would have been impossible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, things change. But also, when you look at... You, you, again, you look at the, the social implications, I'm not saying whether it's good or bad. You know, sometimes technology is a good thing. Sometimes technology is a bad thing, right? We don't know, really. It's a bit like the cookie. We don't know whether it's a good cookie or a bad cookie till we eat it, and then it's too late. <laughs> right? So, for a lot of people, like in 20 years' time, they'd say, when am I going to be? 78, right? And I might be looking for a nurse. I might want to, you know, I might be, who knows, you know, hopefully I can still throw a leg over, but if, <laughs> if I can't, I'm probably going to be looking for a nurse. So, I mean, you know, this is like if it's the cost of a new car or something like that. I've got this, you know, very attractive, for all intents and purposes, very attractive looking woman who's going to, you know, sort of make, cook dinner for me and, you know, rub liniment under my legs and, you know, all the rest of it, you know. And I mean, that's just from a practical point of view, that makes a lot more sense than, say, you know, going into a nursing home or, or, or buying, you know, or hiring someone to come in and do that, which would be more expensive. You just go out and buy a one-off capital expenditure of 25000 and boom, you've got a nurse for the rest of your life. So there are some practical things. And also there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of single people in, in the world, you know, I'm one of them. And, you know, it's, it's not an easy place, you know, particularly when you, if you get an older person, you know, it's, it might be a bit easy when you're a bit younger and you've got a wider group of friends and you go to the pub and yada yada. But when you get older, you know, it's not that easy. You've got Facebook or, you know, um, RSVP or Tinder or whatever. And it doesn't work for everyone and, you know, all that sort of thing. So there's a lot of uh, applications for that, you know, for people that don't necessarily even have to be older they can be, you know, in their 30s or 40s and they're just lonely and they're not hitting anyone. Um, and so that's that's uh, an appropriate thing, you know, for me. But again, as you were making the point about same-sex marriage, there's going to be a certain amount of, um, uh, what you call it, uh, shame factor and, you know, all that sort of thing initially. But, you know, just as there was, you know, I mean, I suppose if someone saw you at the gay Mardi Gras on TV in 1970, right, it would be really embarrassing, right, if you were at work and all that sort of thing and someone said, oh, I saw you at the gay Mardi Gras. I was like, hmm. Now people go to the gay Mardi Gras, hey, it's me, <laughs> Doug, <laughs> I'm here. You know, like it doesn't matter. So it's, it's the same sort of evolution of, of what is acceptable and what's not, you know. And then if you move further from not just as far as robots as partners, but then you, you know, I mean, we're already starting to see the possibility. I believe there's a driverless, uh, uh, a driverless bus being tested somewhere. Yeah, driverless bus in Sydney, they're testing now. Um, so as a cab driver, I don't know how long I'm going to have a job. Five minutes, thank you. So, you know, I mean, there's all these sorts of things which are coming on, which are AI, is the more they... Because AI is a big thing at the moment. AI is a big thing at the moment. So as everything goes into that AI thing, right, you know, whether it be robots or whether it be um, driverless cars or whether it be, like, there's even, I then saw the other day, there's a restaurant, and I think it might be in Korea or something, where all of the waiters are robots. They're all robots. You just, they just come up, what would you like, sir? Yeah, I'll have a 
you know, do, 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 do the money. Thank you, sir. They go off and come back, get it. So, so there's going to be a huge change, you know, it, it created by this kind of technology that's going to happen over the next, you know, 20, 30 years. And we're not, again, it's just going to happen. No one's going to test drive it. No one's going to see how this is going to all work out. Are we going to end up like Schwarzenegger, you know, like Terminator? You know, are they going to take control? A lot of people, Stephen Hawkins in one, believes that if you take the idea of the uh, badass aliens, you know, most uh, Stephen Hawkins for one is thinking that they're more likely to be um, a, 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 a robots that have have reached that level of capacity that they are now superior to the human inventors and the human inventors. I don't know. They just maybe they're slaves or they get wiped off or they they might end up like the what was that in the War of the Worlds the Molochs and the, the whatever. <laughs> I don't know, but. Um, you know, so that sort of thing, right, could happen as well. So, uh, uh, yeah, so a lot of changes going to occur in, in, in technology. And, uh, you know, and as I said, I guess we'll find out what happens at the end. Yep. Back in 1977, I went flying out of Narromine and went to Parks Telescope, and the bloke said there, they picked up signals then, which came up in the movie, and now that's different. I read a bit about our galaxy and stuff like that. The reason the Milky Way is on an angle, because we're on an angle. They reckon we're in part of a different galaxy a long time ago, and there we are. With the energy business, I read an article where the scientists put some junk up in space back in the early 70s, and they read it all wrong. What's happening now? Our part of the solar system, which is probably a few billion stars, is going through some energy field, and that's probably what's happening. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, as I said, I, I think th they're not 100%. No one's coming out and saying 100% what it is. But I think that the difference is, and the, the point is, that the fact that they're putting it as a, as a real possibility, or maybe they're the burst of advanced alien craft, the fact that they're even thinking that way, you know, I don't care what it turns out to be, the fact that they're thinking that way is like, well done, guys, you know. Good. Yeah, yeah. That's where the energy come up from. Yeah. Oh, that's done. Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thanks very much for your. Oh. Have you had What's that? Have uh, just one brief one. It was over the M7, uh, it's M4 or something, but it was about, well, it was about that high and about that wide. Some sort of an unmanned probe just stayed there, hovered over the M7. I drove underneath it. That's it. Okay. I've got to go. Thank you all. Bye.